Asha Behaalotcha, Numbers 8, 1 to 12, 16, is when you go up or when you set up or when you kindle. And uh, the word Allah, not Allah, okay, Allah means to go up or to ascend, but it's also where we get the word Ola, Allah is the Ola offering. And Ola offering went up before the Lord, but it was completely consumed in fire. So that's why they say it goes up because the flames go up and it burns and it consumes. So it ascends, so it goes up. Right? So Beha Aloha is the name of this parsha, but we're not talking about the altar. We're going to talk a little bit tonight about the trumpets. We're going to talk about the ark. We're going to talk about the menorah and, uh, and touch on uh, uh, the prophet that, that the father had sent to the people of Israel, be speaking of Moshe. So we're going to touch on a few things here tonight, which means we're going to go kind of quick, okay? Because we're going to try to cover, cover a lot of ground here pretty quick, and uh, I hope that we can do it justice in the meantime, all right? So again, we're, uh, this parsha Beha Alotcha, Numbers 8, 1 to 12, 16, and um, here we go. Let's start, it, let's start with Numbers 8, 1. So now Yahweh said to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aaron and say to him, When you set up the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light in front of the lampstand. If you look in the Hebrew in verse 1, what it literally says is that when you, when you set up the menorah, the lights are to shine their light to the face. Now, think about that. It doesn't just say that they're to shine the light forward. It says that they're to shine the light in the face. And that makes me think of a few things. And it should you too. Like the light of his countenance, the light of his face. And what we see is that the menorah is symbolic of something, or should I say someone. You know, in, in a lot of traditional literature, the menorah is called the light of the world. And the way that the, the, the tabernacle and the temples were designed, they weren't designed to let light in. They were designed to let light out. And so there's a lot that to, to keep in mind here, okay? So we keep reading. Numbers 8, 2. We did 2, verse 3. So Aaron did so, and he set up the lamps in front of the lampstand as the Lord commanded Moshe. And this was the workmanship of the lampstand, hammered work of pure gold. From its base to its flowers, it was hammered work uh, according to the pattern that the Lord had shown Moshe, so he made the lampstand. So the question is, what's the pattern? What pattern was established? What was the pattern that was made here? Okay, because he, he couldn't just say, well, we need a, a menorah, we need a lampstand, and so uh, let's just design something. There was something specific, and, and you know, the Father has a plan for everything the way he wants things done. And it had to be done according to that plan, because in it, there's more specific things that we may not understand, that we might not see, but it's to be done a certain and specific way. See, because this is how we can read through the scripture, and it continues to grow and continues to be in depth, and it just continues to, uh, to, to flourish in our lives as it's revealed to us. Because the Father has things designed all throughout his word that as we explore it, it continues to grow. And the menorah is just one example of that. Okay, and I'll show you some things involving the menorah tonight. So what was the pattern? Exodus 25, 31 to 37 says, So you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work. Its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. And there shall be six branches. Interesting. Keep that in, keep that in note. Um, when, you, when you hear a terminology about the menorah, you're going to have um, things that, that resemble trees. And, and so this is going to be symbolic of a, of a tree that is set before the Lord in the holy place. And you may or may not see where I'm going with this. So it shall set the branches, six branches along with its sides, three branches of the lampstand on the one side out of it, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it, three cups made like almond blossoms, like what? Almond blossoms, like an almond tree, and, and Aaron's rod that budded was what kind of a tree? What kind of a, a rod? From an almond tree, okay? So three cups made like almond blossoms, each with a calyx and a flower and on one branch, and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on the other branches for the six branches going out of the lampstand. 
Verse 34, And on the lampstand itself there shall be four cups made like almond blossoms, with their calyxes and flowers, and a calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches coming out of the lampstand. Their calyxes and their branches shall be of one piece with it, whole of it a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. And you shall make seven lamps for it, and the lamp shall be set up so as to give light on the space in front of it. Okay, so when we read here in Exodus about the pattern and the way it was to be made, we also saw another witness of that in the book of Numbers, Bamidbar, when it says the light is to shine in its presence, in the face of it. It's not just to shine forward, but the light was to shine in the face of it. Okay, again, it, that, that's to give us terminology that makes us think of something else. So the menorah had how many branches? Seven branches. Or you could say it had a trunk with six Okay, but the number was seven, right? And, and a flame and a fire burned over each one. And it makes me think of this, Revelation 4, 5. From the throne came forth lightnings, voices, and thunderings. And before the throne were seven flaming torches, seven flaming torches, which are the what? The sevenfold spirit of God. So what is the sevenfold spirit of God? Guess what? We find that in the Tanakh. See, one of these things where we, we read something in, in, uh, in the Brit Hadashah, we read something in the, in the New Testament, and in order to understand what these things are, we need to go back to the Tanakh to get an understanding of what's being said. Okay? This is why it's so important to, to, read the Tanakh, to read the Brit Hadashah in light of the Tanakh. You don't read it backwards. You, know, you start at the beginning and work your way through. Okay? You don't start at the end and work your way forward. All right? So what are, what are the seven spirits? We find in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, it says, A branch will emerge from the trunk of Yeshai, Jesse, and a shoot will grow from his roots. Again, now we have branches, and we have a trunk, and we have roots. What's, what, what does it make you think of? A tree, right? But we said that, that, the, that these branches had fire, had flames. And we see in Revelation, it was the sevenfold spirit of God. So here we have in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, so it says, what are these spirits? It says, the spirit of Adonai will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel, power, the spirit of knowledge, and fearing Adonai. These, this is the sevenfold spirits of the Most High. And we find that all of these spirits rested on one man. Who was it? Yeshua. Okay, so this is, this is something that we find and uh, the, the spirit of the living God is, is it before the throne, but as well as it is with men. And it had a purpose here in our midst. And it was to reveal the Father, his heart, his desires, and his plan for us. Okay? So on here, we had 22 almond bulbs. Okay? As on, on the menorah, each branch had its, had, its, uh, had its own set of the almond bulbs. All right? And we had... Six had the three on each side, right? And the one in the middle had four, right? So three times six, 18, plus four, 22. So it's interesting because there's 22 letters in the alphabet, and I'm not just pulling that number out of a hat. <laughs> okay, there's 22 letters in the alphabet, and 22 represents God's justice and perfect judgment. Now, what does this have to do with anything? Because the, the high priest, when he would go in into the presence of the Lord to inquire of the Lord with the Urim and the Tumen, which we don't really know what they look like, but we do know that it would, it would fit inside the Hoshin Mishpat, which is translated as breastplate, but literally it's the breastplate for judging. And on each of, of the stones that were inscribed, they had the, a name of one of the tribes of Israel. And it's not like the breastplate itself was not pure gold. Each stone had a gold setting, and it was, had a, it was a woven work, and it was folded over. So the Urim and the Thummim, whatever it was, could fit in the pocket that was made there behind the breastplate for judging. And Ur is from the word light. And Thummim is from the word Tameh, which is perfect. So the idea is perfect light or perfect judgment. And so when he would go in to inquire of the Lord, what, what they believe, which... No fact, okay, so, this, so you don't have to agree with me on this. But what they believe is that somehow the Urim and the Thummim, the breastplate for judging, 
and the menorah, which was light, okay, and see, because the light would interact with the light, and it would have something there that would help explain the tough circumstances or when, the, when Yahweh wanted to, to say something to the high priest or he wanted to tell him something or render a judgment or do something like that and Moses wasn't here, how was he supposed to find out what God wanted him to do other than casting lots? He said he was supposed to use the Urim and the Thummim to help him in judging. Okay? So they believe these things interacted with the menorah. So how would it interact with the menorah and how would he understand what's being said? You ever hear the phrase, well, do I have to spell it out for you? <laughs> well, yeah, you kind of do, which is what they believe <laughs> it was. So if you had the, the, the menorah and you put the alphabet over each of the bulbs, this is what you'd have. Going down, you know, the first one, Hebrew starts on the right. So going down, you have Aleph, Bet, Gimel. Then the next one, Dalet, Hey, Vav. So it just goes on, so forth and so forth and so forth, right? So if you take these and... Consider the center stem on the menorah is called what? <coughs> shemash. Servant. Shemesh. Shemash. It's also the word for son. Okay? But it's, it's the word for servant. And so the servant of light or a servant of righteousness is who? Yeshua. So the center one that feeds all the other ones is the one that whom everything stems from. Are you starting to see some things? So here's something interesting. If you take the Aleph bet as it was given and tie it in with the menorah, and you read the center stem, it's a word. And the word, starting at the bottom, working up, because he came here so that we could go there. <laughs> if you start at the bottom and work your way up, the word is Malchi. Malhi, which means my king. Malik is a king. Malhi is my king. So when he approached rendering judgment from the Most High, he was seeking the word of the living God from his king. And so the, the menorah was to shine its light to the, to the face of it, which would be where the priest would have stood, and is supposed to testify of our king, who was the light. See that? Amen. Now, a few scriptures. John 8, 12 and Matthew 5, 14, Yeshua says, I am, what? The light of the world. He says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have light which gives life. And then he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. So how can he say that he's the light of the world and then say that you are the light of the world? Because if he dwells in you, then the light that we have within us is not our light, it's his light. And so if he is the light of the world, then we are the light of the world. Or we are to be light to the world. Right? All right. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. I, Adonai, called you righteously. I took hold of you by the hand. I shaped you, look at this next part, and made you a covenant for the people. Covenant for the nations to be a light for the nations, to be a light for the goyim. So what is part of our responsibility in this? To be a light to the nations, to be a light to those around us. Verse 7, so that, there's a purpose here, isn't there? So that you can open blind eyes, free the prisoners from confinement, those living in darkness from the dungeon. Amen. Isn't that what Yeshua said he came to do? And so if that's what he came to do, isn't that our purpose as well? So this tree of light also alludes to a tree of life. Think about that. Doesn't that fit? This tree of light also alludes to the tree of life. Genesis 2.9, speaking of the tree, out of the ground Yahweh God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, the tree of what? The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't forget, guys, there were two trees in that garden. It wasn't just one tree that was in the garden. There were two trees in that garden. And there was only one you were not supposed to eat from. You know what that means? 
that means that the Father intended us to eat from the other tree. What was the other tree? The tree of life. But instead of eating from the tree of life, we chose to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then, because we ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, man, mankind was exiled out of the garden. And, and I believe this was an act of mercy, the reason why he was, because if man would have partook of the tree of life in a fallen state, could he be redeemed? So he had to, he had to, 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 to put him out of the garden so he could ultimately return him to it. He couldn't eat from the tree of life until he was prepared to eat from the tree of life. Okay? And so how do we eat from the tree of life? And what's the tree of life? Let's keep reading. Genesis 3, 22. So then Yahweh God said, Behold, man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. See, I wouldn't just blow in smoke. It's there, right? Therefore, Yahweh God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken, which, which alludes to the fact that he was taken uh, he was created from the clay outside of Eden and placed in Eden. Okay? And the, so he drove out the man in the east of the garden of the Eden. He placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay. So the tree of life, it's Etz Chaim. The interesting thing is that in a Torah scroll, the, 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 the spindles that hold the scroll itself are called Etz Chaim tree of life. And notice it's two. And the Torah scroll itself has pages that could be called leaves. The leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. So the tree of life that's there, it's Chaim. The Torah is a tree of life. And, other, and, and, and the word of the living God given to us gives us life. And so we're supposed to eat from the tree of life. But we cannot partake of the tree of life in, a fa in the fallen state. We must teshuva. We must repent and return and go back to the Lord our God so that we can partake of the tree of life and to do it His way. Now, something else that's pretty cool. I thought you might like this. And the, um, and the blessings that are given in the Torah service, they have this phrase. Okay, and, and it's, it's three separate parts, and it reads this way. I got it here so that I can read it a little better, because that's a little small up there. It says, Excuse me. Did you get that? It's three scriptures. It's three scriptures. And the, scripture, the first scripture is Proverbs 3.18. She, speaking of wisdom, is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold, who hold her fast are blessed. So where do we get wisdom? To the Spirit of the living God. By His Word. By His Spirit. Okay? Proverbs 3.17 is given next. It says, Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. And then last, Lamentations 5.21, Restore us to yourself, O Yahweh, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. So when, they're, when they have the scroll and they're saying the blessings over this in the Torah service, these are the words that are being proclaimed. And it's all about restoration and bringing us back. And Father, as we come to seek your word, we seek your wisdom. Because we don't want man's wisdom, we want God's wisdom. And so when we come to him, we seek his wisdom, we seek his ways, we seek his life. And these are the things that we desire when we open the scroll. Okay. Revelation 2.7 he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, overcome doesn't mean to just conquer, guys. Overcome can mean just to hold on and not let go. Okay? So to he who overcomes, I will grant to eat of what? The tree of life, which is where? In the paradise of God. So the tree still exists. It's still there. 
And I believe it, it alludes to the, the Word of God itself. And if John 1 is true, which it is, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it is that Word, verse 14, that became flesh and dwelt among us. So at time, the tree of life relates to Mashiach. Okay? Revelation 22, 2. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, notice there's a river, and he will be like trees planted by Psalm 1. Okay? Um, to the streets and also on either side of the river, the tree of life with, oh, check this out. The tree of life has 12 kinds of fruit. 12 tribes of Israel. 12 kinds of fruit. And it yields its fruit each month. Now, I don't know if it's one type of fruit each month for each of the 12 months or if it's all 12 kinds every month. I don't know. But regardless, that in itself is amazing. Okay? And the, and the point is that all were productive. All right? So yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Revelation 22, 14, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to tree of life. What does it mean to wash your robes? It doesn't just mean just to get the dirt off, does it? We're talking about white robes. We're talking about the righteousness of the saints that when we come before him, he will change us and will dress us in white robes, wedding robes. And then the white showing righteousness, the righteousness of our king that would come before him. Not our righteousness, his righteousness, right? So blessed are they who wash their robes so that they may have right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. It's the only way you can go in is by the gate. You can't get in any other way, right? Okay, moving, moving on. Numbers chapter 9. We're going to, uh, verse 17 and 18. This kind of leads us into the next part. It says, Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tent, the people of Israel continued their travels, and they camped wherever the cloud stopped. Now look at verse 18. At the order of Adonai, that's gonna, that means something, at the order of Adonai, the people of Israel traveled, and at the order of Adonai, they camped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they stayed in camp. Numbers 9.23, at Adonai's order, they camped. At Adonai's order, they traveled. And they did what Adonai had charged them to do through Moshe. So what does it mean at the Lord's order they gave? You know, at they moved and they, and they, they wouldn't move unless he ordered and they, and they did move when he did order. So what does it mean when they said order? The word is pay, which is mouth. So at the mouth of Adonai, they moved. In other words, what, it's not just the mouth, but the function of the mouth, which is that which comes from it. So at the word of the Lord, they moved, and they would not move until he said. And that's something that we need to learn as well, right? So how did they move, and how did they know what, when they were to go or when they were not to go? Well, this is where the trumpets come in. Numbers 10, verses 1 through 10. We have two trumpets, and they were hammered silver, one piece, Hammered silver, which silver in Scripture also alludes to redemption. So keep in mind, that's, that's something else there too. So the silver trumpets are, are distinguished from the ram's horn in function and appearance because there's a difference between the ram's horn. The ram's horn was about this big. It was curved, right? And they hold it this way. And it's not the same as the big silver trumpets. They had a different sound. They had a different purpose. They had a different function, Okay. So the silver trumpets are distinguished from the ram's horn of function and appearance. The ram's horn announced the day of atonement through the land. We find that in Leviticus 25. But, and it's also used marching around Jericho. Can you imagine these little ram's horns and they're blowing them and that, with that shook Jericho and the walls fell. There's a little more to it than that because it also says that I, I believe that God blew his shofar too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you read the account of that, it, it, it kind of says that. All right. So, the silver trumpets were also used to call people into action. When the silver trumpets were sounded, there was an action and a purpose of things that were to happen at the time, which is another side note. Pinchas used, the, used these in the battle against Midian in uh, Numbers 31, the silver trumpets. It says that you were to blow the silver trumpets and you were to be remembered before the Lord your God. There is a memorial before the Lord your God that's set up before, Okay. Hmm. Is there more to that? Absolutely. 
uh, if I can get this to change on me. There we go. So two trumpets made of silver. The, the, trump, the silver trumpets were used to assemble. They were used to dispatch. They were used to call certain people, not just all the people. There were, there were certain calls that meant certain things. They were used in battle. They were used in worship. All heard the trumpets, but not everyone was to respond every time. There were specific calls that, get, that were given to specific people that when this call goes forth, it caused a certain response. You know, and, and this is not the way it was. I'm just using this in, in a way that we can understand. What would happen if they gave a call to go to war and you thought it was the, the, the call to come and eat? I'm not saying there was a call for the mess hall, okay? I'm just using this as an example, okay? What if, you know, they, they sound the shofars to get ready to go to war. They sound the trumpets to get, get ready to go to war. And you think it's like the triangle. Come and get it. You, yeah, it's not going to fare well for you. All right? So it's not just a matter of we need to respond to the call for us, but we need to be able to discern the calls. We need to be able to discern what's, what we're hearing. Okay? Numbers 10, 1 through 10. Again, um, Yahweh said to Moshe, Make two silver trumpets of hammered work. You shall make them. You shall use them for summoning the congregation for breaking camp. When, uh, and when both are blown, all the congregation gathers at the entrance of the tent of meeting. But if they blow only one, then the chiefs, the heads of the tribes of Israel, will gather themselves. When you blow an alarm, the camps that are on the east shall set out. So, see, I mean, there's, each one had a, different, had a different call, had a different purpose. Six, when you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that are on the south shall set out, and an alarm is to be blown whenever they set out. But when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow a long blast, and, but you shall not sound the alarm. Again, each specific cause. And the sons of Aaron, check this out. Who? The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow the trumpets. The trumpets shall be to you for a perpetual statute throughout your generations. I'll come back to that. Verse 9. And when you go to war in your land against the adversary who oppresses you, now check this out, this is for battle, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered. Now, what, now we, we know what remembered means in Scripture. To be remembered before the Lord doesn't just mean, it doesn't mean he forgot you and now, oh yeah, I better check in on them. To be remembered before the Lord means he, he is now going to act on your behalf. Okay? So you blow the trumpets and it says, and they will be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. On the day of your gladness also, and at your appointed feast, and at the beginning of your months. Uh-huh. So there's more set times that these were established. At Rosh Chodesh over the burnt offerings, over the peace offerings, over the, 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 the three-foot feasts, the three-foot festivals, the offerings that were made there, the silver trumpets were supposed to be blown because that will, it's, it's, God says, when these sound, I will act on your behalf. Okay? Not because that moves him, but just, I believe it was a reminder to us that that's what he does. Because okay? sometimes we need to have the picture in order to see what he's doing, Right? So we need to learn to, use, to, to move in unison and to move together. What I want us to keep in mind is this. Our ministry, or put it this way, my ministry, quote, you know, however that is, because technically we all have a ministry, okay? Because we're supposed to be living this life out there, which means somebody's watching you, which means you have a ministry, all right? <laughs> so, but my ministry, quote, is not more important than the community. It's to work with the community, not outside of it. We must move in unison and in order as a people of Yahweh, not as a person of Yahweh. Okay? Even though one person does make a difference, we're better together than when we're apart. Okay? 1 Corinthians 14.8 says, If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? And that's the problem. We have people who are not trained to sound the alarm, sounding alarms, and people are getting alarmed. And it's people who are not trained to do so. Okay? But when you make a noise, some people are going to listen. And if they don't have the discernment that's needed to discern the calls that are being said, who knows what it, where it could lead. So we have to discern the sound of the trumpets to make sure what we're hearing is what the Father is saying. Okay? To say, I hear by the Spirit. Okay, which one? <laughs> right? All right. So who was to blow the trumpets? The priests, Aaron's sons. I'm going to put it this way. 
Those in proper authority who had been trained to do so made the appropriate calls. Because the priests were held at a higher standard. The priest was held at a higher accountability to the holy things than, than just the, everyone of Israel. Because they were supposed to guard the sanctity of the holy things. And so the priests were entrusted with sounding the alarm and making the calls and teaching the people and doing all of those things. Blowing the silver trumpets was Aaron and his sons. And the question is, so where would they, where, where would they sound the alarm from? Where would they do this from? It's not like they would climb a hill and go do it. Where would they do it from? From the heart of the assembly, which is the tabernacle or the temple. Okay, the Mishkan or the Beit HaMikdash. Right? And in relation to the temple, I'm going to show you something very interesting. In uh, Rico's, Rico's course that he did this past January and, uh, on treasures of the temple, he, he pointed something out that was pretty interesting. You know, there's a, there's a big debate going on about the, the location of the temple and was it the Temple Mount or was it other places? And guys, if you look at all the research that's there, there's no doubt of where it is. It is where it is, you know, because it's the only place that it could be that fits all the requirements, okay? And there was this stone, and I'll come more in depth as far as where this was and why this is a significant find, but there was this stone called the trumpeting stone. I think it was either six or eight feet long. And the original stone is in the, in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. But what's the big deal about this stone? And, and how do they know it was a trumpeting stone? Because it's inscribed. Okay? It says, this is what it looks like. Okay? Now you see it has Hebrew writing in there. So this is a, a, a writer's rendition or a, of, a, of, of, of the drawing of what they believe this would look like, okay, of where it, would, where it would sit. Now, the interesting thing about this is this location of this was on the southwest corner of the temple, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. The inscription says, Lebet hatkia lehak, and it stops. It's, it's broken, so that the words are not finished. Okay, now, hatkia is tekia. How many shofar blowers we got? What's tekia? It's, it's one of the blasts on the, on the trumpet. Okay? So, Takiyah, it's the first two words, Lebet Hatkiah, mean to the place of trumpeting. Okay? But the last Hebrew word is, is not finished. It's incomplete. Scholars have suggested completing the inscription with either Lehakal, which means to the temple, Lehakon, which means to the priest, or Lehakriz, which means to announce. Most scholars agree with the latter, to announce. Okay, so to the place of trumpeting to announce, because what would the priest sound the trumpets for? To announce to the people multiple things. Over the, to, sa to sound the trumpet over the offerings. As the Shabbat is coming, they would sound the trumpets before the Shabbat would come so that people knew that the Shabbat is almost here. And, uh, and, and so to gather the people, and so this is all there. So this is a place that was done. Now, as far as the location goes, I'll get to that in a minute. Luke 4, 9 says, So Hasatan took him, him who? Yeshua. Okay, to Jerusalem, and he set him on the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, jump from here. The highest point of the temple was the southeast corner overlooking the Kidron Valley. According to Josephus, if anyone looked down from the summit, he would be giddy, and his sight being unable to encompass such immense depth. Okay, so that's the southeast temple. But just as high, really, was on the southwest corner near Robinson's Arch. And this was known as the place for trumpeting, the southwest corner. This stone, in 1968, when they were, they, they were looking around the area on the Temple Mount, and they found this stone under a bunch of rubble. Why is that important? That means when the temple was destroyed, it fell there. It hadn't been moved because it was under all the stones from that era, from that time. So where was the temple? <laughs> right where they said it was. Okay? And so the southwest corner, this is where the priests would stand and to do. And this is why it's one of the things, guys, where we need to, to just come to the Word and, and examine these things and let the Word say, and not just look for the next conspiracy because there's always going to be out there, next conspiracies out there. And I'm not saying to be we're not supposed to be ignorant of things as well. But let's spend our time in the Word. Let's spend our time in what the Father is telling us here. 
because there's a lot of distractions that are very bright and shiny and interesting to keep you distracted from what the Father's desiring for you. Okay? So, again, Josephus talks about the trumpeter that stands here and that he would announce the beginning and the end of Shabbat. So moving to the, to the ark. Numbers 10, 35, and 36. When the ark moved forward, Moshe would proclaim, and this, again, this is part of the Torah service, right? Moshe would proclaim, Arise, Adonai, may your enemies be scattered. Let those who hate you flee before you. And when it stopped, he said, Return, Adonai, to the many, many thousands of Israel. Now, the rabbis say that in these two verses, there is enough revelation, enough knowledge in these two verses of Scripture that it could be an entire book in and of itself. Why would they say something like that? There's a lot to that. We don't have time to get into all of it. But I will show you this. There are two inverted noons that bookcase these two verses. So when you're reading in a Torah scroll, it sets it apart and sets it aside, sets, definitely draws your attention. Okay? And you're not going to find this in, in a Bible. You know, you're not going to find this in a King James translation. But you will find it in the Torah scrolls. And it looks like this. Now, if you look at the arrows, you find the noon, and you notice that it is what? It's, it looks a little different, doesn't it? And if you don't know what the noon looks like, there, here it is. This is what it normally looks like. You see that? So it is different, isn't it? All right. So an ancient Hebrew noon would look like this, and it was to symbolize seed or fish or life, to quickness or to increase or sprout. And it's the quickening of life. Life. Now, so if a noon means life, what does an inverted noon mean? You can say it's inverted, so it means death, yes, but it's still a noon. Its meaning didn't change, but its application did. So though, you, though it alludes to death, it's still life. So an inverted noon means quickening of life from death. What does that sound like to you? Resurrection. Job 14, 12. So man lies down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would keep me secret until the wrath be past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. And you shall call, and I will answer you, and you will have a desire to the work of your hands. This is talking about resurrection, guys. Matthew twenty two thirty one. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read which was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, of, but of the living. Colossians 2.15 says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them, openly triumphing over them. He conquered death. Okay? Job 19.25 says, For I know my Redeemer lives. Not like will live, not has lived. He lives. All right? And that he shall stand in the, in the latter day. That word stand is kum. It means rise. So I know that my Redeemer lives and he will rise in the last day. Ah. Upon the earth, dust, earth, clay. So in the last day he shall arise upon the dust of the earth. Who is the dust of the earth? We are. And though after my skin worms, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh... I shall, shall I see God. It's not in my spirit, not in my, in my flesh, I will see God. That's resurrection. You know, the idea of, so where did they get this thing? We're going to get a new body and everything. Job knew it. Numbers 10.35. So it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. Let them that hate you flee from before you. This is Yeshua's resurrection. And then when he says, return, Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. Literally, it's millions upon millions. The thousands of millions of Israel. There aren't that many. So who does that mean? That's our resurrection. And Messiah's return. All right, moving on. Numbers 12. 
So Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moshe because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. Okay, a few things on here, guys. Cush is the area, it's, it's an Egyptian territory, right? Well, guess where they were? Egypt. When he, came out, when he came out, he went to a place called Midian. Hello. Okay. And his wife that he took from Midian could have descendants relating back to Cush. <coughs> Whatever. Okay. Here's the thing. This is about, it's not really about where they were from as much as it is about covenant. God keeps covenant. Okay. That's the important issue. That's what we need to remember. Because even when Israel came, there were those among Israel who were not natural-born descendants of Israel that were joined in with Israel. And now we have Israel being scattered into the nations, and there are people returning from all nations from everywhere returning to Israel. So it's not about a color issue. It's about a covenant issue. So why would she have a problem with Moses and his bride? And say, maybe, and this is just one, one idea, one train of thought. Again, you don't have to agree with me. It's just food for thought. Maybe Miriam was trying to stand up for Moses' wife. Why would you say that? Because what, what was her accusation against Moses? Let's, let's, let's take a look at it. So, so again, the, the woman he had married, the word there for Mary is lekach. And says, because he had married her, Lekach. So Yahweh makes a covenant with all who receive him. So that's really not the issue. The second form of the word Lekach, which means to take, but it can also mean to be removed. If we read through the scripture, we find at one point Moshe sent his wife away. So why would Miriam take issue because he married a, married a, a Cushite woman if he had sent her away? But why would Moses even send her away? I mean, well, shouldn't he care for her? I don't believe he sent her back to her dad, who would care for her, right? But here's the thing. Why would Moshe remove from his bride? Remember that thing where we're talking about those closest to the tabernacle have to keep the holiness and the sanctity of it? Okay, Moshe was on the mountain. And Moshe was in the tent of meeting. So Moshe had a higher standard even from Aaron. In, the, in regards to holiness and clean and unclean and holy and common. Look at this. He was always, let's just say, on call to the tent. Which means he had to be careful of things that would profane him or make him unclean. And let's just not get technical here, but just, just look at it. Relationship between a man and a woman would render, some, would render him unclean until he mikvahed and sundown. So if God says, I, have, I need to call you here to my tent, Moses, and Moses says, mm, I can see you tomorrow. Wouldn't really go well, would it? So Moses had to set himself apart, even from his wife. And so I believe Miriam was kind of taking up issue with that. So were they complaining because of race or because of position? Seems like that happened a lot, doesn't it? Even uh, Korah. Moses, Aaron, you take too much on yourselves. No, they were doing what the Father gave them. You know? All right. So we're complaining because of position. How do we know this? Because if you go on and you continue reading, you find what, what they're saying. It says, Is it true that Adonai has spoken only to Moses? Hasn't he spoken with us too? Okay, let's answer the question. Did Yahweh speak to them too? Yeah. Matter of fact, when he spoke, all Israel heard it. Which kind of is dangerous in and of itself because then that, that, that gives people the idea of saying, well, we don't have to listen to Moses because we hear from God too. But no, they heard from God and didn't want to hear any more. And said, Moses, we can't stand this. You go find out what God says. That way we can ignore you. Wait, no, it didn't, it, that's not what it said. <laughs> no, it said, Moses, you go find out what God said so that we can do it, right? So they asked Moses to go to the Father on their behalf to receive the word so that he would bring it back to them. Okay? So even that, Aaron and Miriam was like, well, God speaks to us too. 
um, not like that, you know? So now this man Moshe was very humble, more so than anyone on earth. I don't think Moses wrote that, guys. I think someone else wrote that. <laughs> Suddenly, it means unexpectedly, Adonai told Moshe, Aaron, and Miriam, you three, my office now. And he says, come out. And the three of them went out. And Adonai came down in a column of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent. Imagine he stood, stood at the entrance of the tent. Can you hear it now? <laughs> he comes to the tent, goes in the door, and he does speak to them. And what does he say? He said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. Why? Because he is faithful in all my house. With him I speak, some translations say face to face. Literally, it reads mouth to mouth. Spiritual CPR, if you will. It's pay el pay is the word that's given there. And so what happens, if you go back to the burning bush, you find that Yahweh told Moshe that I will give my words in you, and you, in turn, will open your mouth and give my words to Aharon, your brother. So he's saying, literally, with him I speak mouth to mouth, or what he could saying is, mouth to mouth I speak in him. Not just with him, in him. Here's some food for thought. The prophet does not believe in himself. He believes in Yah. He does not undertake a lead because he sees himself as a leader, but because he sees a task to be done and no one else is willing to do it. His greatness lies not in himself, but beyond himself. In a sense of being summoned to a task that must be done, however inadequate he knows himself to be, he must do it. Scripture says, that, that Yahweh searched around for a man to intercede, and there was none, so he gave of himself. It's the same type of a thing. In Isaiah 6, we find something in regards to Isaiah where he testifies of, of his relationship and the things with the Father. What did, what did Isaiah say when, Yah, when, he, when, when Yahweh was there and he was in before the Lord in his throne room? What did he say? Did he start complaining about how the people were? Or was it just him and the Father? Yeah, there were angels, there were seraphim, there were all these other things, all around, but, but it was him and the Father. He didn't care. At that point, he didn't care that, that about that guy and that guy and that guy and that guy and that guy. Do you see what they're doing? At that point, he was laid open before his Father. And he responds with, woe is me. I am doomed. I am undone. Because I am a man with unclean lips, and I live among people with unclean lips. I've seen with my own eyes the king, Adonai Tzavaot. And one of the seraphim flew to me with a glowing coal in his hand, which he took from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Here, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is gone. Your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of Adonai saying, Whom should I send? Who will go for us? And I answered, Hineni shlachini. Hineni, here I am. Shlachini, send me. Our life will drastically change if we could just get an honest look of ourselves before our king and respond with one word. Hineni, here I am. Hineni. I don't have an agenda here. I'm just here. Whatever you want is what I will do, where I will go. Not what I want, what you want. When we surrender ourselves to the Father, amazing things can happen. We must surrender to Him, though. So, mouth to mouth I speak, not just with Him, but in Him. So clearly, and not in riddles, 
He beholds the form of Yahweh. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moshe? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And Miriam was shut out from the camp. How long? Seven days. Why? Because the unclean were set outside the camp for at least seven days. Right? And we know that she, be, she became leprous. And Moshe pleaded for her. And, and so, well, she'll be restored. But she's going to be outside the camp for a period of time. So, seven days, and the people didn't journey until Miriam was brought back. And afterward, the people were moved from Hazarot, and they pitched in the wilderness of Paran. And that's where we will end this place. They are in the wilderness of Paran, which is where they are staged, which is where they are about to send spies into the land. So they're, they're, they're getting ready to go into the land and take possession of it. They're not far from it. They're getting ready to go in there, but they're, they, they, they need to uh, review within themselves of where they stand with the promise, which was a mistake in and of itself. We'll talk more about that later when we get there. But uh, that's where we have now. They're staged, they're poised, they're positioned. Are they ready to go into the promise? We'll find out later. All right.